All right, so I'm going to call tonight's meeting to order. Um, before we jump into the agenda, I just want to bring up a small item. Um, we are back in this space. We were here before. You guys don't know that we were here before. It is a very cozy, comfortable, it feels like we're very really back location. But I would like to maintain the decorum that we had at Chamber, on the council chambers. So no sidebar conversations, no discussions among yourself. It makes it very difficult for meeting minutes. It will make it very difficult for our community members um, to hear. So we'll do the same thing even though we don't have like, the buttons and the speakers. If you'd like to recognize, just raise your hand. So, um, all right, it's all there. Okay, let's jump into roll call. Melanie Burgess? Here. David Roche? Here. Courtney Michelle? Here. Sanders Stewart? Here. Council Member Peck? Here. Um, and now I'd like to see if anyone has a motion to approve the meeting minutes from our February meetings. I make a motion to approve meetings as they stand. I have a second with Sandy. Okay, any discussion, corrections? All right, great. Easy week. Um, I think do I have a vote to approve? Oh, aye. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Sorry, to approve. We already did that. Okay. Um, okay, how about communication from the staff? Cool, thanks. First off is posting location. I forgot to do this at the last meeting, so we need to designate a location to post our meeting agenda. Um, historically, it's been at Calvin City Hall or the, across the street. What's that? The Civic Center, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's where you posted historically. If we want to continue posting there, we need to make a motion recommendation. Okay, so you need it's, to vote on this one? Yep. May I ask a question? Do we need to make a motion to approve and then discuss just like our meeting minutes? Or can we just go ahead and have a discussion? Oh, discussion. Okay. So when you mean post, that. Uh, like a physical thing? So the official posting location. Not the someone. website, it's Correct. like that paper goes somewhere. Yep. To notify anybody who wants to know that it's in here. Yep. Okay. And historically has been City Hall across the street. Right. So should we consider changing that with all the construction? There's probably not a lot of activity over there. It fixed that all. They did? Yeah, it's all open now. The door's open and the posting area is clear. Oh, okay. How long do we expect to be in here versus so moving probably, back to there? I think we just heard that it's, it's probably until July at the earliest. Originally it was June and they've already run into issues. Hmm. Where else would you suggest? Another option could be front doors here. Would people know it's up? Look. Here? I think the issue would be is you want to keep them all together with right. the other boards and commissions, and so we're trying to keep them in the civic center for that boards and commissions. This is just a kind of parliamentary kind of okay. procedural thing. We're okay. just trying to, you have to approve it technically. But if okay. we can keep it in the same location, I think people would understand that. Sure. Are other boards and commissions staying over there with their postings? Yes. Okay. Okay. I move that we post over in the civic center building. City Hall building when we have been in the past. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. All right, next on here is uh, board commission emails. So um, we are now recommending that you guys each set your own email, probably something separate from your personal personal email to use for board communications. If we were to get a public, public record request, that would probably help in making that a, a more seamless transition. So um, you can do that at your leisure as you will, but I recommend that you do create a separate TAB email, separate from your personal email. And I have an informational email over to the board that came out from our city clerk. So there's some additional information on that. 
Next on here. Sure. A question. Um, so this would be a private email account, though. Yes. So not a city email address of any kind. Correct. Okay. Could one be created that is, you know, we don't work for the city, but we're an advisory board member, and there's a consistency in that, like tabadvisoryboard.com or something like that. So I mean, it's not hard to create with a Gmail type thing. My understanding is we don't provide the emails for the boards. Okay. So we could maybe. I mean, it's up to you. Okay. I, they men mentioned, I don't know if it's an information item, they give the examples, and now I'm, I'm driving blanks, but we both attended the meeting a couple weeks ago um, that the city put on for boards, and they did have a pretty simple recommendation, like your name at board or something like that. Yes, I went ahead and put mine on there. And so I put my first name and then dot, last name dot, and then put tab okay. at gmail.com. So that would be an example. Okay. okay. Next on here, uh, Chrissy update. As you probably saw the news, we were successful in our Chrissy application. So we got an additional $4 million coming in for quiet zones. We're working on the agreement for that, getting all the, the paperwork and understanding that grant process here shortly, and then continue towards our goal of constructing all those quiet zones. So pretty exciting to, to get a win there. It's big news for us, I think. So how, uh, at the time that article was printed that announced the award, it seemed like there were still some unknowns on how the city can map make the match and when we can reach that. Is there anything more known? So the match will come from the street fund. Uh, we will, depending on when it's, well, we're looking at the when it's due, but I don't anticipate any issues with covering that. It's been a clear priority from council to do this, so we will be able to have our match for sure. We have, a, we have to match the $4 million grant, so we have to match $4 million for the 50-50 spread right. that we, we um, ask for in our application. So, our plan right now is to do a million dollars every year for this process, so the four years, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's, yeah, we're, we're, we'll do the million dollars per year. We'll come all at one fell swoop, it'll be okay. over, it's over four years. Yeah. And then how close does that get us? So based on our most current estimates, that gets us all of our crossings done, except for first and every is not included, but that's a separate project currently kicking off construction. And it also doesn't include the Ken Brat crossing, which is part of another CIP. Right. Put everything up. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Great. So, next thing on our list from uh, communications from staff, which I keep it brief, but we're uh, heading out to Washington tomorrow. Um, the mayor and I are going to Washington with the uh, Mayor's Commissioners Coalition, the US 36. Group that started out with US 36 and now it's become a whole one plus area. I'm actually going with Chris Quinn out here over uh, from RTD. So um, mm -hmm. we all go as this giant group and we, we kind of make a pitch. And last year it was the Chrissy Grant. And so we learned a lot of things before we applied for that grant during this trip to, to DC because we actually met with members from the Federal Railroad Administration. So we were able to talk to them directly and find out what they were looking for in these grant applications. So we're going to do the same thing this time and also. Um, um, you know, lobby for this new what's called build grant. So the build grant, we're asking for $20 million. Uh, we have the support of CDOT. We're hoping to get formal support from RTD, but uh, it is a project that helps at 119 and over as far as getting the uh, buses through there, as well as getting uh, there's an underpass portion that would take the boulder bound traffic um, under Hover on 119. And so that frees up a lot of capacity for us as far as getting the left turns across and different things. I've handed out um, this to all the board members of the for the audience concerning the topics. But if you'd like to see a little one pager that we're going to give to all of our senators and representatives, um, this is what's this is what's going out there. But uh, uh, we're pretty excited. Uh, we have again full support from the from this from the whole corridor, really from Broomfield. 
Louisville, um, Boulder County, Boulder, uh, and Lafayette, New York, uh, Superior, Erie. So a number of folks are going to be on the trip with us, and so it's going to be pretty exciting to, uh, to try to lobby again for a, a great project in the corridor. So uh, we'll get that going, and, uh, and that's kind of where we stand on that. Any questions? Well, we're going to submit it. Um, we're really trying to secure that grant in 2020, start contracting in 2021, go through final design and environmental clearance. That's the big one to take. That's going to take a lot of time to go through our final design for that project. This is just a this is just a very conceptual design on that here. Uh, and then we'll go to construction hopefully in 2024. We have to have the dollars spent by 2026. Or 27, sorry, 2027. So we've built in a year of time there, but we really need to make sure we get it spent by that time frame. If, if we get it, we, we will you know, try, just like we did with the Christie family, we'll try and see what happens. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it's an opportunity to talk. <laughs> um, my name is Buzz Feldman. I live at uh, 3135 <coughs> Park Way. Um, I was actually on this board for nine years until they moved it. But I've uh, <laughs> been on it for too long. Um, but I have four things I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, first off, congratulations on the railroad crossings. Uh, that is just phenomenal. It really puts Longmont out there in the forefront. Uh, in the state, so, you know, that, that's so good. What I just heard you say there, I kind of raised a question, uh, and I'm not going to answer now, but just because I understand it's not a dialogue. Um, but uh, does um, in kind work count towards that 4000 that the city has to provide? I mean, obviously, it takes staff time, it takes planning, it's going to take a lot of man hours to get that done on top of the four million. We wish. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, okay. the, feds, the feds don't see it that way. So. Okay. Darn it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing is thanks for the pipeline changes. Uh, the double line, I don't know, I know there's a name for it, but the double lines with the hash you know, in between is just phenomenal. It, uh, it's a good that when I saw those, it's like, wow, you guys are on the, the ball. So thank you all for that. Uh, two requests or suggestions or no suggestions. Uh, one is um, consider a traffic light at the uh, on Ken Pratt at Sherman if you haven't already considered one there. That is a uh, intersection. I've heard so many people um, talk about that that it's impossible, particularly during rush hour, but any time of the day, to be coming out of Sherman and in either direction and trying to make a left mm -hmm. turn. You just cannot do it. Mm -hmm. um, on the uh, south side, you can go to, you know, backtrack to Kansas and get to Sunset, but um, I've seen accidents that uh, anyway, mm -hmm. take a look at that if you can, uh, or you can or something that you can do. Um, the other thing is on uh, westbound Clover Basin Road uh, between Dry Creek and Fordham. There's a sign, a merge sign, it goes from two lanes to one. And the merge sign there is exactly the opposite of what people are doing. It says uh, merge right, the plane ends merge right. Everybody merges left. Mm -hmm. So basically the sign needs to be changed. Uh, <laughs> what's already happening? People are ignoring the sign and doing what they perceive as being safer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Every year we ask the regional transportation district folks to come, uh, and we're lucky enough to have our board member here tonight, uh, Judy Lubau, is here <laughs> with the rest of the group. Um, Sage Tormo, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Oh, for real. Sorry. I said <laughs> I should know what Javi Abbas, Chris Quinn, Brian Matthews are all here from uh, Regional Transportation District. We work with them every, just about every day or every week at least. We, we talk to them quite a bit. So we'll hopefully, we're hoping you can provide them uh, the utmost respect of uh, having the Regional Transportation District come and, and uh, give us a report on what's been going on with uh, RTD over the last year. So I'm not sure who's first, but we'll give you the seat of honor. Part and then Chris has some slides okay. additional. So, um, yeah, if you want to come to the computer or the, the keyboard, we'll just. Uh, right. Right. There's one right here. Oh. Mm -hmm. you donated your chair and to then uh, you can take Neil, Neil's off.
10 o'clock? He's he loved the schedule. <laughs> uh, the only three doesn't come from the station. Or did you have to do The sad no. Yeah. From, from Bloomfield. Yeah. So from so Bloomfield. We so you can, you can still, from Bloomfield, you can catch it. The only three is the only thing that runs for this hour. The okay. last one, I don't know. It's, I think it's about 10 o'clock because there's an FF yeah. that allows the FF Union Station to Bloomfield to then catch that LD3 to get to move on. So there's still a connection available later in the evening, but it's not the one to see bright. The last northbound one is actually on Saturday at 11. So, but that's the room field one that starts at room field. Correct. So LD3 is, yeah. So LD3 operates weekdays and midday, one early morning southbound trip, and then the later evening trips on weekday also are LD3. Again, the demand um, did not warrant those one seat ride trips um, to have the full operation from the Union Station to Longmont. Um, by operating it between Bloomfield and Longmont, um, it cuts back on the running time for the overall trip, so we can actually provide these additional trips, which we wouldn't have been able to do previously. Um, how's, that, how's the ridership on the FB3? Cutting to that, you know, <laughs> I got it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that overall, um, that's the biggest change. Um, flex rides, success rides, all the rest has stayed the same. Um, so moving on, I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Matthews here for a couple slides. Thank you. Uh, my name again is Brian Matthews. I'm a manager in our bus operations group. And Flex Ride Special Services falls under my area. So Flex Ride's been good here. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but for many years we had a coordination program with VIA Mobility and Accessoride and the FlexRide services all together. Unfortunately, that program ended this past June uh, because of uh, VIA had decided that there were some funding issues. We were grant funded and they decided to back out of that agreement. It was costing them more than what we were getting through the grant. They pushed more people to the flex ride, and our numbers have been strong. They've been over four boardings per hour. Now, let me explain that just just real quickly. What that means, we have we have four vehicles operating here in Longmont during the weekdays. So we take the entire ridership for the day, and we divide it by the revenue hours for each vehicle. We want to strive to have over three boardings per hour. We do well up here. We're doing four and a half in that area, up to five. We're up, oh, we go from we August. Go. We go from last one board. So, so when we go give you the dates, we're doing apples to apples each year, picking the August run board, which is end of August through the beginning of January. That is the last complete run board for us we are currently in the January run board. Last complete run board would be August 2019. And I'm, I'm looking at January and February numbers I have that aren't up here, but they're strong at around four and a half per hour. Which means it's gone up. So that means on the average, four people and a half a person get on a vehicle. <laughs> and uh, so it's after the run here. We also, um, now the flex ride is not included in the fare buy-up, we're still charging fares, and I guess I should ask this question. Does everybody know what the flex ride is and how it operates in the community? Or do I, need, oh, no. <laughs> do I need to give a quick explanation? Okay. It's basically, uh, it's a small vehicle, seats 14, has room for two wheelchairs and two bikes. Customers can call or they can get on our website, or they can go through their mobile device and they can order a ride to come to their house. It is considered curb-to-curb -curb service. It's based on a first-come, first-available, and the driver or the, device, the scheduling device is trying to group rides. So, just real quickly, let's just say tomorrow, I want to get picked up here at the Civic Center and I want to go back home. So at 12 o'clock, I do it online or I talk to the driver, I want a 12 o'clock pickup. 
If it's available, driver's doing nothing, that's easy. Yes, we'll pick you up at 12. Be ready five minutes early, 10 minutes late. We pick you up, we take you to your home. Easy peasy. But it's never that easy, is it? No. So let's just say um, there, the driver, there's no bus available at 12 o'clock. What it does is it will offer alternatives an hour before, an hour after. There's some negotiation going on basically with the customer. We can get you at 11:40. We can get you at 12:15. It, it's not a share, It's not a Uber or Lyft. It's a shared ride. We may pick you up at 12:15, but we may go over and pick this woman up over here, this gentleman up, drop this woman off, drop you off, then drop him off, pick up somebody else. So it's a very dynamic service, and. Uh, it's actually, it's kind of a love or hate. People love it or they hate it. Yes, I recognize the board director back there. Yes. It's accurate that there are some people that have recurring rides. And that's yes. going to impact the availability. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And what she's talking about is our subscription rides. You can book a lot of people, like you go to work every day at 8 o'clock or school, or come, like I know there's a gentleman who comes to the library once a day, or I've written with the last time I was here. So you can book if it's available. You don't have to call, you don't have to book. It's just set, once you're set up into the system. We call those subscriptions. Those are about 50% of our ridership. The rest of the ridership can call in same day. There's no qualifications. Anybody can ride it. Sometimes the seniors don't like riding with the 12 year olds, <laughs> but that's the way it goes. It's first come, first serve. Unlike Accessoride, Accessoride is a program that the federal government requires RTD to provide. There are certifi a certification process through Easter Seals. You have to have a cognitive or physical disability that would prevent you from riding the normal fixed route service to be certified on Accessoride. Now Accessoride is under the Fair Buy Up program where uh, if the trip originates, there's certain rules and regulations. I'm not gonna go into that. It's too, I could sit here, chat till 7.30 or 8. But no, but basically <laughs> the, the city of Longmont is under the Fair Buy Up program they're paying for accessoride trips, the local fare that picks up in Longmont and stay either, well, it has to pick up in Longmont. It can go to Denver, but we're only paying, you're only paying the first $5. Those trips, I didn't look those up, but I think they're about 6000 a year. That's increased significantly since the fare buy-up mm -hmm. because it, your program is to give people more options, it gives people more options. Instead of taking one trip to go numerous places, they now take multiple trips, even in the accessoride. So, so uh, let's see, so I will move into, and I'm, I'm available for questions. Uh, Can I ask about accessoride? Sure. How, how is that working here? Do you have, are you getting uh, a lot of riders? Yes, yeah, the ridership here, I said there's about 6,000 boardings a year. Oh, that's what you said, okay. Yeah, that. and that's gone up a lot. Not only has the population expanded up here, but people are, you know, where maybe when, $5, my personal side note, $5 for a trip is expensive, mostly when you're on a fixed income. $5 to go to the library, $5 back, that's $10. When you're on a Social Security income of $7, $772 now, that's a lot of money for a trip. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're allowing that person under your fair buyout to now make that trip for free. And believe me, they're using it. Okay. okay. I have a quick question. Yes. Two, two questions. Flex ride. What is that a five dollar or is that no? Five? Flex ride is a normal RTD fare. 
is three dollars one way for an adult. There's a discounted fare for uh, children and seniors at a dollar fifty. And that's if, just one way. Yes. If, okay. If you have an Accessoride card, you get to ride Flexride for free. And we do have a lot of people on Accessoride who uses Flexride because we're same day reservation. You can call, it has to be available, but you can call at 1130 for a 12 o'clock pickup. Accessoride, you have to call 24 hours in advance. And it's free, so a lot of people use it. Um, well, now with the, they still use it a lot because it's same day pickup, unlike Accessoride. And Are you going to say something? Just want to make sure to clarify that the flex, the Fort Collins, Longhawk Express, oh, yeah. is out of the Fort Collins yeah, transport. Yeah. Oh. It has the same letters, but it's a different, completely okay. different operation. Yeah, don't, yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure. All right, and then the so other. A flex and a flex ride. Mm -hmm. Sure, okay. So the, the second thing is with the flex ride, you mentioned the subscription schedule. So for those folks that are on subscription, do they still have that variability in terms of start time, stop time, get there? There's still a fight, fight. Well, you meant like it could be an hour before, it could be two Oh, no, no. After. Once you're locked into your subscriptions. Then it's consistent within it's, a 20-minute window. Right. It's consistent within that 15 okay. minutes. Okay. All right. So I'll run into special events real quick. And uh, up here in Longmont, you have a variety of special events. Um, I might as well just say it. it. They have all been recommended to be discontinued, not just here in Longmont, but throughout RTD. I'm sure most of you have heard. Did I go into why they've been recommended? Okay. All right. We're facing a issue at RTD called a driver shortage operator shortage. It's very hard to find people to work. I'm sure the city has found that same issue. We upped our salaries by two dollars. I think that was about a year and a half ago. So a first year driver with some moderate overtime comes in at about 45000 That's not bad for a 19 year old with a clean driving record. Um, the problem is, is that we have more service out there than we have drivers, so we're mandating a lot of our operators. So we hire all these people in. This has been a cycle for a few years. We hire all these people in. We make them work six days a week. It's crummy hours, mostly when you're on the road. <coughs> totem pole. But keep in mind, people still volunteer for overtime. We're not talking about the volunteers. We're talking about the people you are going to work on your day off. They get tired after a while. I don't think any of us like working six days a week. And they leave us. And we've tried all types of different things. It's not a money issue after six months. It's a, I'm tired. I want to see my family. So. Uh, because of that, we're missing, routinely, we're missing train and bus trips. I don't think we are here in Longmont, are we? I mean, as far as the blue buses? Um, not the, the 300s. The 300s. Um, not the 300s. And beyond some of the regionals. On some of the regionals, we have had, yeah. So it's unfortunate, I will say this, because I've been at this company since 1985. We have, we are seeing a lot of inconsistency in our service delivery. You're out there to catch a bus and it's not there. You're out there to catch a train and it's not there and you don't know when. We're trying to do a better job communicating that, but it's hard. Continue to try to recruit, but in the meantime, what they're doing, I call, I think we've turned it right sizing. They've tried to go out there and put service bring service levels down to a more acceptable level so we don't have to what we call mandate. I don't think it's going to end all the mandating, but it's a start. Now, the special services, we're doing this on fixed route too. 
the special services, especially her RTD, and her the regular customers on weekdays. Remember, we're carrying, I think our boardings are close to 500,000 on weekdays. Special services, and correct me if I'm wrong on that, I think, does that sound about right? Mm -hmm. but, no, I think it's more like 330,000, but it's still huge. It's, it's about 330? Okay, yeah. I don't know where I got that from. Um, but special services, the Broncos ride, we carry about 8,000 boardings, or 8,000 people. Can be anywhere from six to 8,000 people, maybe 10 to 12,000 boardings each game. What happens with the Broncos, the Buffs, the Run Ride, that's Boulder Boulder and the Rocky Service, even though they're on holidays on the weekends, they put a pain, they, they help hurt us on the weekdays. Not only do we have to mandate to operate these services, we have to, on Broncos Ride, we have to roughly about 200 drivers. Not, I'm not talking about weeknights, I'm talking about Sundays. Mm -hmm. There's regulations in the transportation industry called DO, Department of Transportation. How many hours you can work per week and all this good stuff. When they're out here driving these special services, it reduces what we can do during the weekdays. Therefore, it's a ripple effect. This isn't going to solve all of our issues, but it's going to make a big impact. Is RTD able to do anything for the Boulder Boulder? That's a huge impact on this community. Yes. Do you want to address that, Judy, or do you want me to tell what I know? Well, what you know is probably what I know. I'll go with whatever the board packet says. Okay. Yeah, whatever the board packet says is that, that the proposal now, because of huge amounts of squawking about it, mm -hmm. huge, and it really works to complain, mm -hmm. <laughs> that is going to be put well, it's proposed to be put back for a year, and that'll give us time to work right. something out for the next year. Mm -hmm. Because this was going to really, really make things rough for that race. You know, I'm, so I'm, that's the proposal. I'm going to, uh, let me just jump on that real quick. When we put a proposal together, staff, myself, Nodley and her team, and Sage, we put it out to the public for public hearing. That we get all types of comments. I just heard we got three thousand <laughs> more yeah, we than we got twenty meetings and then input them. Yeah, three thousand emails that came in. A lot of them were in the Boulder Boulder. I read mm -hmm. oh well over a hundred at least. Then staff goes back and they look at the comments and they try to adjust. Now Boulder Boulder in particular is in May. We've worked with them for many years. I know the owner of the Boulder Boulder. We've worked with them. We're very close to them. We've tried to accommodate. So the staff recommended keeping that for one year. Everything else would be on the cutting block. So. Um, I'll, I'll speak to that. Yeah. Yes. Tomorrow night they will discuss this. And we're having a big meeting before that. And then they will technically vote on it in two weeks. But they have to do something. The board, I mean, it's up to the board at this point. They have to do something. They have to. And this is the adjustments we made, really. I think it's, we were like this, and we've adjusted down to here. They're still going to be mandated. Still Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But I think. How many more? Um, I think it's going to save us for about 40 operators. Yeah, it's, it's somewhere 27 in rails, I think, what I heard, which is um, where we have the biggest issue uh, percentage-wise in the shortage of operators. And then the rest of them are going to be um, on operators on the bus side. But that is not just within the RTD, that is within our contractors as well. The contractors are going to have one division um, that is doing well. It's TransDev um, that operates the Southwest Denver routes mainly. Um, the other divisions are also suffering. The division up here has everybody, including the general manager, arriving. That's why you're not yeah. having trips on the locals. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, anything else I need to talk about? Or no, I think that's it. Unless mm -hmm. somebody has some more questions. We can go later. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So that was great. Um,
On one hand, I've been keeping track, and this is uh, because of the fair buy-up. We've been kind of keeping track as to um, what the ridership has been since the fair buy-up, just to see what the impact is. Um, notice it says ridership average boardings. Just so you know, we differentiate between ridership and boardings. Ridership is whoever rides. It can be somebody who gets on a bus multiple times. Boardings is how many bodies actually get on and off the vehicle. It's different. You can have a set group of riders who board more frequently. So you can have 50 riders, but 100 boardings. Because these 50 people get on the bus twice. Okay, so just keep that in mind. That's why we, we go with boardings and not ridership. So just keeping the stats um, and see that in August we actually had changed the L to the LD and LX and split it out into um, the uh, 28736 corridor versus the I-25 corridor. And you can see the um, numbers if you add them up, that actually was a success because ridership went up and has been steady and has gone up. Um, if anything, the LX is actually the route that we would consider, and we did. <laughs> we did add a trip on the LX, um, where there is demand uh, for more service, um, bonding into the midday, because uh, a lot of the students, they go back and forth. So, um, but overall, in August, it was uh, you know, 1,400, basically 1,406 um, for both the LD and the LX combined which is the highest it's ever, it's, it's been, and actually it's ever been since these stats, um, the ridership's only gone up. Um, when we look at Jan January's in operation right now, we make the change to the LD in August, so um, we're waiting for things to settle with the ridership. It's a huge change by having that midday portion no longer go to Union Station, but have that additional LD3 just between Bloomfield and Long London and having the transfers. Um, and then some of the, the trip times also had to be adjusted, so we're very much on half hour service in the AM peak and the PM peak in both directions. Uh, so there have been some challenges. People are getting used to it. Um, it's not exactly the same time that they had before. Uh, we've had some issues with our internal system in regards to stops and patterns, and we've, I think we've got it all worked out at this point. Um, so ridership at this point is a little lower than what it was before we made the change on DLD. But that was kind of to be expected also. Um, DLD, as it serves the US 36 corridor, when it comes to Broomfield, it actually picks up boardings for that corridor to take to Union Station versus DFF. There was some ridership, there were about 80 people on the LD, 80 riders, plus or minus hundred and some boardings. <laughs> um, those trips are no longer there in the day, right? because the route only goes to Bloomfield. So those folks have shifted to the FF. So that's going to reflect in the statistics. You're going to have less on the LD, but you're going to have some more on the FF. We're going to keep a close eye on that. Um, usually when we make a big change like this, we let it go for about two or three run boards before we would hone in and say, OK, we're going to make significant adjustments as warranted. Does that mean more trips, less trips, actually shift trip times? Um, but with this change, we immediately heard um, from quite a few folks that there were some challenges, and we have gone ahead and already made some adjustments for the May run board. So in the morning, we have changed one trip by demand from um, an LD2 that was just going to stay on 27 to go through Lafayette Park right at 6.16 in the morning. <laughs> and then in the afternoon, we have changed one that was an LD2 and also was just going to stay on 27, and we've changed it to go through Lafayette Park and Ride at 5.35. So that matches actually that AM and PM demand. Um, so we do listen. We do try to make the change as best as possible. Um, again, resources are tight. Um, sure, so we have to make it work within those resources. And um, a lot of times, if you try to make a change like this, um, it can have a very easy domino effect because um, for instance, the, the trip through Lafayette adds about 12 to 15 minutes to the trip. That's huge for an overall trip. That's about an hour plus. So if you make a change like that, you have to have enough time between that trip getting to Union Station and then it's next leave time. Or you have to rehook all the trips and play the big puzzle and then you could end up having to use more resources. So, Luckily, it worked on this one, 
stage to put a wizard on us. He had dreams, nightmares, and he said, dreams, nightmares about <laughs> Teldi. I, I have. I have two questions. So the first off, the folks that contacted with regards to changing the route, how did they do that? And second is, what would be the best way for, for people to forward information to you that a ride is not working, or a time, or how did that? Can we, we have the official public process. So that change in August went through extensive public process. We actually had tried a change the previous August. So overall, staff and the uh, stakeholders and Director Lugo have been involved for over two years. Um, so we had gone out to the public before, um, had contacts. People know where to find us. Sure. <laughs> they email, they call, and they send in comments through the service uh, change at rtdfn.com. Um, we have the additional public meetings to where we um, then get. We had at La Mia, the first we had over 50 people that one time, but was, no, maybe even more. Um, it was, yeah, it was a huge crowd um, to us. August but August this was 20th. the preemptory that was meeting. Preempt. So we get all that input, sure. trying to then massage as best as possible sure, sure, sure. the resources that we have. Once we put it in place, yeah, these people have been part of it, they're writing, they know where to find us. Uh -huh. They email, they call, they send okay. it to service change, they come to contact your actual mobile. Okay, all right. I was just, so, just wondering. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's all I had. Oh, yeah, and then there's the official uh, service change for sure. We put that out, we put them out on the buses, it uh, goes on the website, so uh, um, it's pretty extensive. Okay. But we've actually figured out this last go around, just by accident, because the meeting was listed incorrectly, that most people go to the website to find out where meetings and where our changes are, mm -hmm. not in a brochure. The brochure was correct, the website was incorrect, people showed up for a meeting, it actually hadn't been scheduled, but yeah. we made it work. <laughs> well, I do need to applaud you for changing after having given everybody so much time and then rolling it out and then having them complain about what they've already been discussing and then have you change it for them. I think that is mm -hmm. that's a, that deserves accolades. Yeah. We, we try to as best make promise if we want the ridership, but we want, we want it to be purposeful and effective. So yeah, as best as we can, we have some way to happen. So, um, I added this one, this, the breakout of the routes um, wasn't in the last years, but I figured just visual. <laughs> you can see it's been pretty steady, but uh, since the fair, uh, free fair ridership, ridership um, boardings, boardings <laughs> have increased, um, although they have leveled out over the last two plus years. Uh, it's been really steady. Uh, when you talk to the operators, uh, and they have been pretty steady up here, actually, for Stranded as well. Um, it's the same ridership. It's the same people who are riding. When previously, they would ride once a day because the, of the fare. Now that the fare um, is free, oh, we also pay for it through our taxes. <laughs> the fare is free. They ride more often. And therefore, you have the increase in words. We also have to get you to change your slide to, it started to be initiated in July 25th, 14th. Sorry. Yeah, that's my first full run board with the full data is August. Right. So I... But we don't need to see where yeah, it was I, before the right free started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I, I think, think that's what people want to see. Yeah. Kind of oh, jump. Yeah. that was the... Yeah, yeah you see I, it here, yes. Yeah, you see it there. And I, I guess I could highlight that somewhat. That, um, you look at the 323 eight. right in the very top left corner, it says 192 yeah. boardings. Mm -hmm. And then you go to August 14, and right after mm -hmm. we did it, it yeah. jumps up to 150, yeah. and then 4 again, and then... Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. But it's, again, I mean, you can see it's gone up. People figured it out. They're using it, which is great. Uh, but it has leveled out. It's a specific um, number of passengers that are using it. Um, and the 324 is, yeah, it, it goes up, it goes down. Um, we increased that uh, service level to half hour in 15, because it was the grand, 16, yeah, so it's where on the last, yeah, but you know. Um, so yeah, well, there, there, here's, here's one little, with the free fare, the number of boardings are up. The number of boardings, warrant the service levels that are currently out here. If free fare goes away, these numbers will plummet 
Mm -hmm. And the service levels for out here will no longer be warranted. And we're going to mm -hmm. have a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yes, we will. We're having these discussions and trying to figure out how we can work around it for the, ever since we started on <laughs> the idea. Um, but I have to say that uh, for us, it is a huge concern. We don't want the ridership or the boardings to pump. We want to keep what we have. It's working, it has a good purpose. It's helping a lot of people get around. Um, so we're going to have to keep putting our heads together. And it's, um, Heather, our, our CFO, um, could not be here tonight. Um, but you know, Judy, if you want to speak to it a little bit later, when we come to the resources and so forth, and if there is anything that you haven't heard. But just know that we're well aware of that. Um, that I, we also know that it's been a struggle for the city to continue to buy up the fares. So we're going to continue those discussions, um, especially as we're looking forward for the potential change for State Highway 119 BRT, even though that's five years out. We're somehow going to have to figure out how to cover that because it all goes together. The local rules and the region, everything goes together. So just know it's on the right up and well aware. We're going to try as best as we can on our end to keep it going. So, um, then combined, just wanted to see, so it's a, it's a full picture, and you can see again, it's the same, you know, ridership was, has gone up slightly, the recordings have gone up slightly, I could, and well, ridership as well too, because there are actually a few more people riding than before. But boardings overall, but then it has pretty much leveled out over the last couple of years. Um, which is good, this, and again, as, at this point, these boardings warrant the service that's available. Um, for the regional routes, <laughs> it's a little different. Um, so, as you can see, the, the blue is the bold, the orange is the J, the gray is the L, and then um, again, when we split it out in August of 17 into the yellow, the LD, and the light blue, the LX. Um, again, pretty steady overall. Um, I'm, the bold ridership dropped in 16. And we have not figured out why it dropped in 2016. The FFs wouldn't make up for that because they're start out of Boulder. And that ridership has nothing to do with you know, travel between Boulder and Mama. Um, we didn't change the L at that time. So there's nothing that would have potentially switched from the Bolt to the former BB buses or then the FFs to the LX or LD. So um, we're not quite sure why that change occurred, but you can see since 16, it has been extremely steady. Um, actually, all the routes, of the, the J basically doesn't change, um, has been for 20 some years. Um, and then, as previously said, the LD and the LX, if anything, that ridership now is a little bit more than what the L used to perform. But the Bolt and the J, um, last couple of years, very, very steady. And those are the two routes that will make up the service for the State Highway 119 BRT as a base when we start looking into um, that phasing switchover. Okay. Are all the board members aware of the routes? Do we understand? Basically, what these routes, what those routes were, like that J is a little confusing. It runs from Long One to East Boulder, basically. On the the campus. campus. Yeah. LDs. When she's talking about LDs, does everybody? Okay. So well, just go the, the, the bolt is basically between Longmont and Boulder. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the LD1 going through Lafayette, then coming back onto 287, 36 on 25 into Union Station, where the LD2 just stays on 287 all the way down to, to, to 36 and then 25 to Union Station. The LD3 is the new pattern again that operates between Bloomfield and Longmont in that midday, earlier the AM, that PM midday maze basically in that Saturdays. So, so which LD is that? These are the LD1 and LD2 because the LD3 was only implemented this run board. So when we get the data the next go round, um, and I saw the request for data from Loma, um, we will include that LD ridership. But again, I, I've looked at it previous just, just to see where we're at. And those numbers are slightly down overall for the new LD, one, two, and three. Um, but again, some of that ridership is now on the FF versus so is that a combined LD1 and 2 uh, Yes. Graphic? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the LX is a different, there are also two other two LX. Um, one is north, well, starts at Aiken Kaufman, north Longmont, Highway 66, I-25, straight down Union Station. The other one comes down 27 and turns on for Highway 52 and then 25. Um, in order to pick up at the park and ride, and I want. So it's a, um, they're two completely different ridership uh, bases, actually. Um, so, um, and both are doing well. I can't cannot complain about the LX. I'm happy about the LX. LX one goes, the LX one that goes on 66 and I 25 cannot pick up anybody after these long walks. Mm. Right, because it's outside the district, right? Well, that's what we talked about well, last well month there, there are many more pieces that are within the district, <laughs> but most of it, especially on the north side, outside the district. But, that, and it's, the next stop is Union Station. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because everything else is outside the district. Right. Which, um, the only potential future stop addition would be at State Highway 7 and I-25, where we've been having conversation with um, a whole bunch of folks up here in the north area. There's actually a coalition out of the MCC coalition who's working on State Highway 7 as a BRT corridor, bus rapid transit corridor. Um, that is one of the corridors that was identified in our north area mobility study back in 2014. Um, there were five corridors that could be potentially bus rapid transit, and this is one of them. Um, so, yeah, it's a long ways out. That is, that would be a huge, huge project at State Highway 7. It would be a multimodal um, facility, uh, multi-levels. Um, I don't know if you ever shared the little video snippet. Not that the video snippet is kind of grand, but um, and, well, it's it's, yeah, yeah um, no. it might be interesting for them to see sometime. But um, we'll send it out. Yeah, with, with the State Highway 7. The only other thing to mention is the J and the LX only run. Rush hours. Rush hours, right. So the peak services, so they don't work any other time of the day. Yeah, and on the on the J, absolutely. Um, at this point, it's if anything, it's struggling. Um, it's really not for a regional route. It's it's on the bottom of the, the um, list as we where we would like to see it. Where the LX, again, I said the ridership has increased, and if anything, that would be the route we would focus on and add trips um, because it seems that there's much more of a demand to do later into the morning and then earlier in the afternoon because of the students. Because actually we had looked originally to try and add more than one trip, but we just we just don't have the resources for something on that. But it's it's on the radar. Would there be a consideration going later too? Because I think the last LX2 is five forty five. Yeah. Yeah we've already looked into that. Actually we looked into that when we made this change with the LD and we just could not make it work. So it we're we're aware of it. We're keeping it on our it's not happening. <laughs> um, so, have to the usual standard runs resources become available, but um, yes, definitely keep an eye on it. So, um, in general, regional same thing, just all routes combined for each uh, each uh, run board uh, as we go through the years. And see, it's also it's just very very steady. Um, you know, percent change from one year to the other. It come down down, then it went back up, and then slightly in, and so it's just basically evened out over the last two years. Um, and we'll just keep an eye on it and see, see how it goes. <laughs> um, so local services, you have the four local routes, 323, 324, 326, and 327. Um, those frequency, the, the routes operate on weekday and Saturday. Um, 323, 326, and 327 is hourly, but 324 is half hourly. It's a 
between more is on Main Street, basically. Um, oh, and it's actually on Queens on Saturday and Sunday. That was part of the game. That's right. It is at, it's doing quite well on Saturday and Sunday <coughs> with the half hour service. So um, that was uh, an original grant application for 15 minute AM PM service. Um, I compromised. <laughs> Figured it would be actually be safer for the route to have half hour service all day and then add service on, on Sundays, which hadn't been um, been there. And that was what um, the majority of the folks we, we um, had communications with, with uh, who ride up here, uh, were asking for as well as the extended service. So starting a little earlier and ending a little uh, later in the evening. And we made those adjustments, and I think since then I have not heard of people. It's great. <laughs> Not her <movies. laughs> And there are at least two or three people who were very, very vocal, and they would be <laughs> calling me and emailing me if, if there was anything. So it seems to be working and looking at the ridership um, seems to be going quite well. You said it's on a grant. When is that grant run out? Next year. Yeah. Next, next, next year. End of this year. This is over. Yeah. This grant over? Yeah. Yeah, this grant's over. The Sunday grant? Yeah. Yeah, this one was last year. This one was last year, and the, again, but it falls under the free fare. Oh, okay. So it just buys the service. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So still a way to play. Okay. So just I had put the the maps in um in just for frequency just to you know it's um just the current current network. There's there are the I should have put those maybe up from sorry out of, out of sequence. <laughs> but there's the bolts you can see from um. Longmont to Boulder, um, the J, how it, it, it meanders when it comes into Boulder, and it has a lot of stops in Boulder. It takes forever. Same with the Boulder when it gets into Boulder. It reconsolidated, quote unquote, stops in Longmont in 2016. Um, we had that discussion with the city of Boulder. They adamantly opposed um, taking any of the local stops out and speeding up the regional route. We will have that conversation with them again later on this year um, because it affects the route overall quite a bit, um, especially when it comes to resources. How on the on the J? It's mainly staff. It's not so many students. It's mainly staff, and um, there are um, out of the overall J ridership, which is in here. Um, about a third comes out of the gun barrel that um, I don't know that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, Natalie. Um, for the Boulder, the bold consolidation of stops, will that also be one of those published to yes. the community? Yeah, so we uh, theoretically, when we consolidate stops, we do not have to go out to the public. But if we make such a change, we would make it with the wrong board and we would announce it through the wrong board. We would only consider it on routes where there's underlying local service. So there is a difference between, um, so when we look at that and to say, okay, we're going to consolidate these stops, we would look at where people are getting on and off, especially where coming out of Longmont, folks are going to be older. So we wouldn't remove a stop or stops where the majority of folks are getting on and off between Boulder and Longmont. We would look at the ridership and the boardings that are within Boulder, and then look at those stops and see which ones of those would make sense to remove, because there's already local service available. And you look at the timing of the local service, because some of the Boulder buses only run an hour as well. And no, all of, all of the local and Boulder runs a half hourly or better. With the phasing, um, we're going to have to look at this anyway, because with BRT, the stations are going to be reduced significantly to compared to the current stops. And then again, it's the underlying local service that needs to. And, and we've done the same on the FS, where the Bs, BBs used to stop along Broadway, every stop, and I mean, it still takes forever to get out of the door. Um, but it's better. <laughs> um, where then, you know, yes, you have to take a local route potentially to get to a stop and then board the regional route. Um, for the most part, uh, the stops that are in place on the regional route, those are the stops where the boardings for the regional route occur. 
the, the transfers from a local to regional um, compared to the overall ridership. Um, if, if we hit a third, I think we would talk high numbers. It really is. Most people are within the vicinity of the stop or regional within walking distance, which we consider a quarter mile each direction. But that's the density along the corridor, right? Everybody's basically there already. Um, so LD1, LD2 gives you the see how it has that, that deviation and that little insert. Um, and then here was the change for the LD3 where we took the 225 piece and used those in service hours and put them into the LD3 and then extended it to um, come up to Longmont. And that's, Longmont actually received the additional service out of this change. And they, um, there was actually a benefit for Longmont in the midday. So all the LD3 does is go from Bloomfield to Longmont, that's it? Yeah. Again, in the midday, the ridership to me is not, it's not there, no. Um, the ridership that was showing up on the L in the midday, and there were these riders that were using it as a backup to the FF. So if they were at Bloomfield, um, and if an LD pulled up, they would get on the LD because they could get to Union Station. They wouldn't wait until the next FF showed up, even though the FF's on every 15 minutes. So you had about, said about 100 boardings one way or another. That, yeah. Um, LX, just skin. Highway 66 and the other version of 52. All right, so um, here's the fun part. Did have you have you shared the information? We talked about that last month. Okay. A little bit. Okay. So um, with the 119 BRT study, and I guess Chris, um, you don't have it on your slides. We had that last year. We did the update, but if you have any further questions as we go through, Chris is was the project manager for 119, um, so we can. Yeah, go into that a little bit more if you wanted to. But with the BRT study, we also went ahead and took a look at the current um, local routes for Longmont and took the opportunity to um, create a, a new network, basically, a local, new local network. Um, that would then be what we call a feeder service to the regional routes. So you take the regional route, the BRT, as the spying route, as the main route, and the local services would be there to feed and make the connections to that so that you try to entice people to not drive. <laughs> we'll have to see, park and ride wise, unfortunately, the park and rides are all on the spine. So. <laughs> this is kind of a big deal. I mean, this is the, this is the local bus enhancement that the city of Walmart would get benefit from enhanced local bus service to get people to the to the main spine that she's talking about for bus rapid transit, but it also gets us around the city, right? So yeah. it's kind of a big deal as far as yeah. what we're looking for from RTD in the future. Yeah. Um, and as you see, we said implementation would, be, implementation would be phased as warranted. So again, at this point, we don't have resources, even though we've had these discussions with staff, that some of these changes already might make sense and potentially would be warranted, but we just um, we just can't do it at this point. We just don't have the drivers or the vehicles um, because it will be additional resources needed. Uh, so fortunately, we'll have to kick the can down the road a bit, but it is in this plan, which helps us in the future to go forth and implement it, especially as we kick off um, State Highway 119 that's rapid transit. Is that plan published on the website? No, not yet. Um, we can. Did, did Parsons include it? In the yeah, because the contract was done then. But we can add it down to the uh, State Highway 119 website. So, yeah. Okay, because, yeah, that's, I think, that's what I had waited for was to make sure because it is part of 119, I wanted it to be included as an appendix into the overall 119 document. But, yeah. We can just put it as a separate document on the web page, yeah. Yeah, okay. We'll go ahead. We can do that. Did, did you actually share the document that I had sent? With? No, no. No. Okay, so I we can. I didn't feel like it was final yet, so I didn't want to. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get it on the website and we'll let you know. And Phil can send out the link. Yeah. Not a problem. So, that's you, what we have currently is on the left, and what we would look to do is on the right. And you can see um, the main change probably is the um, 
extension out on the east to Walmart and the hospital. And that is the one, if anything, where I'd say, you know what, it's warranted, but just don't have the resource at this point. And we do serve that by And we flex. do serve that with the flex, right? Mm -hmm. However, we're all well aware that there is potentially more demand. Mm -hmm. And we do hear from folks um, about that. If anything, that is what we hear about. Um, but otherwise, you can see the, the rest of the network is not so much of a change. So you can see how we have um, the 323 extend up to Walmart as well. Is that the turquoise one? That's that. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, it is turquoise. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, versus the green. Is it also going further west as well, or is that a different line? Going down? Yeah. It actually it has a, has a bit of a change as it comes up. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Staff has commented on this. <laughs> to which I responded, it's only a line on the map right now, and once we go through the plan and actually put it into implementation, we will have those discussions with the public. Um, this change right here was something that we had originally discussed a couple years ago. Um, as things are changing within the city and other needs, um, we're looking to continue. We don't have a signal up here. That's the other thing. <laughs> By the way, if, oh, do I get to make a request for a traffic signal? No. <laughs> 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 How about to be heard? Oh, I like a traffic signal at Highway 66 at home. It's in our long range plans. Yes, yeah, right. So that's the other thing. That in, if we, we cannot make that turn safely without the traffic signal. Mm -hmm. So we have to take that into consideration. So the other routing um, is then looking at what the density is and where potentially could we um, entice folks to ride or harvest ridership, so to say. Um, that would be the interim route. Yeah, but some of it goes purple. That way, it looks like it goes all the way up to 25. Yeah, it's um, right. No, that's the, it's, because this is the edge of the map, but this is actually where the Walmart is, right there. Oh, that, okay. Oh, yeah. okay. That's too much. Yeah. That that's the west, Natalie. Is it a dotted line? Is that oh, Silver Oh, this is Creek? school trippers. Yeah, that's the school trippers to the high school. So that's Nelson. Skyline. Yes, Skyline. Uh, yes. No, Sky yeah. Silver Creek. Silver Creek. Oh, wait, Silver Creek. So that's Nelson. Nelson. Uh, so, so this is Nelson. Oh, so, because right now we operate the trip out, trips out of there, um, the ridership is really, really low. It's the kids, really, that ride it in the morning and the afternoon. Um, we also have a challenge out there with the turnaround, um, the terminal. We don't have a restroom location. The school kicked us out um, because they were those folks were writing and they didn't want them on the property. Mm -hmm. um, it was a danger. It was a safety issue. We're talking but, Silver Creek still? Yeah. Yes. So, you know, one way or another. I, but where we're at right now, we do not have a restroom location. So we really cannot have it as a fixed terminal. Per union agreement, we have to have a restroom at each end of the route. Hmm. Within five minute walking distance. All kinds of challenges. Um, so these trips would be selected trips, school trippers only. So I have one probably. But Flex Right goes out there. Yeah. Right. So going out to Walmart, are you is that actually is the bus actually going to go to the Walmart store? Yes, it would actually go around behind where, because there's development back here, mm -hmm. right? There is. And we can actually lay over and terminate here because we could use the restroom at Walmart. Okay. Yes, that's, that's the whole idea. Okay, makes sense. The, um, the, the challenge was that there was a request for the hospital, but quite frankly, hospitals do not create boarding. Mm -hmm. No. People who are sick, you know, they don't want to give them a Flex right is mm -hmm. more on demand. Accessor right is more on demand. Um, plus, it also would have been a challenge um, to get, yes, you could circle around the back, but again, for us to lay over um, terminal-wise, it uh, was much harder to find a spot, and then having the challenge again with the restroom access, where at Walmart, it's you know, pretty much a given. So. But that is in Walton County. It is in Walton County, but it's, in, it's, in, it's been annexed into the city, so anything the city annexes, Outside yeah, of the RTD, okay. city limits. Comes in okay. It's within RTD. city limits. Okay. okay. And so they're, they have to be subject to the RTD tax. Okay. So Walmart, that's why you have Walmart, Walmart does pay RTD tax, but do not pay Boulder County tax. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So more fun to be had with that. <laughs>
<laughs> With that, we would also adjust um, the service frequencies and uh, service span. And I know this is a little hard to see, um, but we'll make sure you get the document until you can actually take a closer look at it. But you can see how um, there currently are, for instance, 109 um, platform hours, as we call it, when the bus is out servicing um, the routes. And in the future, it would be 135, so an increase of almost you know, 25, 26 hours, which is significant. Um, and then um, on weekends, you also see an increase for Saturday and Sunday um, of, of 13 on Saturday, 14 hours on Saturday, and 30-some um, on Sunday. So that's a huge increase. Okay. About three minutes left. Okay. I have a quick question. What is, is the platform hour like the bus is running? What's yes. the definition of Plat a platform? Platform is from when the bus pulls out of the garage to when it pulls into the garage. There's okay. a difference between in-service and platform. Platform, again, from garage to garage. In-service from first time point when they start their first trip to the last trip. Okay. Thank you. That's my half question. <laughs> 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 and I have to make room for, my for Mr. Quinn. He yeah, has we have about 30 minutes left, I think, before. Because you still have time for your yeah. comments at the end. Okay, if you know where to find me, Phil knows where to find me. We will make sure we get to the link to get that up on the web and get you on the phone. Yeah, much. no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. pretty quick. It's uh, essentially just an overview of a couple of things going on. Um, I'm Chris Quinn. Uh, I'm a plant, uh, project manager in kind of the long range section will not only really works on scheduling the day-to-day -day operations of the bus, my goal or my department's goal is more the long range uh, pie in the sky stuff, to be honest. But, uh, yeah, we, we so, do two to five years out and you do five to yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so just, yeah, a real quick, yeah, 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 <laughs> apropos. Um, First item, Northwest Rail Starter Update. Uh, I believe this group has seen the plan um, where we have been working with the local jurisdictions for the last couple of years. Uh, instead of trying to get the full build out of the Northwest Rail, which would be 55 trains per day, would it be possible to just run three trains in, in the morning from Longmont to Boulder and into downtown Denver? and then three trains in the afternoon right back out again with the intent that that would reduce the amount of infrastructure that would be required to still integrate with the BNSF freight services that are underlying in the corridor. Most recently, and I was not at the meeting, but most recently the local jurisdictions and representatives from RTD went down to meet with the BNSF and their head offices uh, on February 21st to discuss a proposal that we had sent to them quite a while back, but they were just getting around to processing. I was not at the meeting, Director Luba was, and I can't, I'm sorry. okay. So, if you guys want to, since the official meeting minutes haven't come out, I don't, I don't want to say too much. Uh, but yeah, I want to defer to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, this was great to be able to finally have a meeting with Bernie and mm -hmm. It was, it was a big deal. Um, we had been asking them for quite a while for cost estimates for what they would charge RTD for construction of this interim commuter service and for operation of it. Um, because we need to know their costs to be able to know what we're going to be paying. We, we just can't figure it out only on our end. Um, it was not easy to get that information, but finally, they expressed a willingness to talk with us. Um, and in fact, they invited RTD to come down and meet their schedule, and meet their modelers, because they had modeling issues that they wanted to talk to us about the peak service plan. Um, nothing ever runs smoothly. Um, it was, I was told that uh, not only would there be RTD staff, but the mayor, 
of Westminster was also going to go. And at the same time, other mayors had not been invited. That did not seem like a smart thing to do. So um, that changed. We kind of worked on um, throwing it open to the other stakeholders if they wanted to come too. And lo and behold, what we had was uh, Mayor Bagley wanted to come. And did you get to join us? Yes. Um, and then Westminster <coughs> was not only going to have their mayor, but was going to have their um, development person and their city manager. And then Boulder County was sending Mount Jones. So it became a very healthy group of people going down there, which actually turned out very, very well. Um, because basically it wasn't just RTD saying, oh, they told us something, but everybody could see what the real issues were. And I must say, they have a bang-up modeling section. I mean, it's just, it was like watching cartoons on Saturday. <laughs> going like it was very impressive. And what they showed us was that even though we were only asking for three runs in the morning and three runs in the evening, it was going to impact them a lot. And not just that one particular line, but several additional lines that, that connected. So it became very complicated. And one of the rules that Burlington Northern has is, OK, if you want commuter service working with us, our rule is that you cannot take away from our business ability to run our business the way we would have otherwise. You have got to pay for improvements that will make us financially whole. And that's, that's it. You want to work with them? you got to do that. So they showed us, basically, um, that uh, one, there was going to have to be positive train control, because um, that's not on there now. And that's basically when you, oh, that's, what, that's basically allowing commuter lines and freight lines to work together, because they will um, uh, coordinate better in case there's a problem. And there was also signal, signaling requirements that have to be created when you're adding commuter lines and freight lines. So that's two improvements, but the very expensive stuff is that there's going to be four sidings that, that have to be created to allow their trains to sit while ours move and not waste a whole bunch of time for them as soon as our trains go to theirs will go in. Um, and so they were basically saying to us, there's going to be these improvements and you're going to have to pay for them. Do you want to move forward? And so, well, yeah. I mean, we want to at least see what it's going to cost. And what they told us is that they were going to have to do something called a 30% environmental and design analysis to get any kind of reasonable cost estimate. That it doesn't say much to most people, but what it, what it amounted to last time was RTG having to pay $700,000 to them to get that kind of level of design work to get cost estimate. So where it was left was we all saw, yes, it's going to be complicated. Yes, we're going to need the four sidings. Yes, we're going to need positive drain control. OK, the next step is we contacted them, Henry Stoppelkamp, our assistant general manager for capital programs, summarized it all and said, yes, we would like to move forward. Contact us about what it will cost. And so, we're waiting on them. But this is a big deal. I mean, it's been a big deal to be able to talk with them. They're not, they don't want a whole bunch of people talking with them. What they were willing to was important. So that's what's happening. We're, um, we're waiting on it. It's going to cost quite a bit of money. Um, don't know, hopefully, maybe some of the stakeholders will help us with some of the cost of that money. We'll see. It's all going to have to be negotiated. Um, but at least it's moving. It's, it's, it's moving. So that's it. Did you have one of yeah, yeah, A couple of things. So, so their BNSF was very clear in the, our operation doesn't require the positive train control or the signalization. So that's going to be probably one of the big expenses that we see. There's some rules with anytime you have passenger rail, you have to have positive train control, which is a connected system so that the trains talk to each other and know where they are. Pretty important if you're running mm -hmm. trains. So that, crash into each other, same with signalization. It's very, very similar. Um, they sound similar purposes, but they're both, they're both needed to run the, 
the train operation. So um, again, that was very clear that, it ain't gonna that that's, that's, gonna, that's gonna be a big cost, we can't do it, and there's no obligation, they don't need it for their operations. If they ran more hazmat, they would have to have positive train control, but, but they're savvy, they know what that number is, and they don't, as I say, they stand to that kind of month before that, so they're not gonna need it. Um, you know, one of the other big things was that to be competitive, I think they want to run the trains at a higher speed. So there are some additional improvements to the track to, to support that higher speed. Um, I think in a nutshell, it's probably, probably the, yeah. the high level stuff. So the yeah. preliminary engineering agreement is the first part that we have to get to take right. away for you guys to get worked out with BNSF. Is what the cost will be and what, what they're going to be looking at? The cost for the agreement. Get a cost for the construction. Yeah. So and, it, and it's not cheap. As right. I said last time, it was seven hundred thousand so. dollars. But uh, it has. To, if we want an estimate, we need an estimate because we need to be able to go to potential funders as well as to the taxpayers because the taxpayers are also potential funders for this. Um, the, we need we need an estimate that makes sense. But they threw a curveball at the end about the environmental and said, "Well, we need environmental on all this too." But I think. Henry was quick to point out that hey, we've done all the environmental work on that. So I think a lot of the environmental is already done, and hopefully a lot of that is still usable with the work that you guys have already done. So more will be revealed about what it will cost. We just know at this point. Yes? So once we do this and have implemented this, the active train control and these other things, will they be running trains that they wouldn't normally run because we'll now have this access? No, no, they're not going to do it. We have to agree that this makes sense. Right, right. I assume that I'm, I'm kind of jumping yeah. to the <laughs> year 2080. But know where you're going. And yes, there would be some huge benefits to them if those improvements were instituted. And I guess, well, the hazmat thing is what piqued my interest. So would they start running hazmat trains through Long Island? Just asking. They can. Okay. It, just uh, in a, remember a few years ago when we were doing a different level of study on the corridor. One of the things and you alluded to it directly well is, and I, it, even though I've been working on the corridor for quite some time, this very profoundly obvious piece of the puzzle was kind of missing in my mind. Is the fact that when you look at their network, which I'm assuming the modeling showed, this is one of their few north-south links on their national network. So, well, at one point in the late 90s when we were doing all the original planning for this corridor and freight activity was way down and they didn't think they needed it, now all of a sudden, um, well now, starting in the early 2000s with freight activity increasing fairly dramatically, it became far more important to them. And then as there's been flooding in the Midwest in the last few years, which has wiped out some of their other links, they're looking at this corridor even more as more valuable for the resiliency pieces. They're not willing to sell. They are yeah. not willing to sell. But short answer to your question, yeah, that it, it, having the positive train control and the, uh, the signalization, which is Right now, it's what they call dark territory, and that there are no signals in this segment of it. So that would be a huge upgrade for them. But if someone else can pay for it, you know, yeah, why not? Do they talk about easements now? Do they need um, to acquire more land, or do we, if we do the sightings, need to acquire land, or do we have it? So they did not go into that detail, okay. and they caveated it with that. They said this is just showing the siding on the model for modeling purposes. We've not okay. paid attention to the land needs for the model that they had done. In previous efforts, when we did the uh, what we call the environmental evaluation, which was, my God, it's almost 10 years old now, um, it showed that there were, in general, the right of they have approximately 100 feet of right of way. And there's some areas, especially in Louisville, where it narrows down fairly dramatically to, I think, about 50 feet. There were areas, though, and curves where there, we might have to establish embankments that it would kind of, we would have, so to speak, clips in the right of way where probably not 
have been fully acquiring this property, but yeah, it, it would, might need five, ten feet to accommodate. Um, even though the right of way might be there just to accommodate the, geog the geometry of the track uh, to allow for you know, whatever curb radius they need or something like that. So, um, yeah, there would be a right of way. Short answer here again, there would be right of way impacts, yes. Part, part of the discussion that came out, you mentioned in basements, and some of the questions that was asked is can the rail be on walls? And my understanding, historically, they've said no, it can't be on on part of a wall to try and reduce some of the slope or property takes. And engineering from BNSF was not at the table, but at the t of those that were there, they said that there is precedence for building the track up on rail, and they pointed at a section in Seattle that was built on a on a supported wall for the rail that could potentially reduce some of the right needs. Yeah. Okay, all of that's going to be still negotiated, of yeah. course. Yeah. Yeah. So do they give a timeline as to um, when they would start the analysis? I mean, I think it's a cost of what that will take, but uh, for the cost analysis, do they two years, six months? What do they give us any timeline? Or are we back to just waiting? Well, I think once the money changes hands, it goes quicker. I guess that was my question. I didn't state it correctly. When are we going to find out the cost of this so that we can? That's one of the things we're waiting on. They didn't give a timeline for that. No. This is the cost to figure out how much it'll cost. Exactly. Right, because there's two costs. <laughs> okay. So, yes. My experience with that, the preliminary engineering agreement that I did for the quiet zone work, I submitted the request for the agreement in January, and it was uh, May when I got the documents back and then through their legal or legal, and it was executed in May. So, about four months to get for the work that we were doing, which is a different scope than what you guys are doing, but just kind of magnitude of. This is a much bigger project than the questions are going. So and what, I don't know yeah. if the agreement will be quicker or not. It's going to depend on the scope. Do they do the agreement or do we do the agreement? I'm not sure how, how that's worked out. So, so they have a boiler, they have a an agreement principle, and it's going to be probably working with RTD on the scope of what exactly they're doing, but the, the legal language is already developed by the NSF. I suspect you guys will have legal over. No time for that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you had a meeting. Thank you very much yes. for putting that together and knowing I think it's incredibly exciting. And then at the end, they opened the wall of curtains <laughs> over the operations center. It was pretty cool. Oh, I wish I could have seen that. Yeah. Yeah. This is a model train set, right? What? <laughs> 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 I guess the other request we would have as the city staff is that that money not be taken from the seventeen million for first of May. Oh, absolutely not. I, I, don't, I don't even know if that would be an option, but I just want to make sure that's clearly stated. Given that it's already budgeted for as a line item, mm -hmm. for that, I don't never say never, but I don't see that happening. Thank you. Just build that real fast, then it'll be gone. Right, exactly. <laughs> spend. spend it before it goes away, yeah. It is very exciting that you finally sat down with them again, yes, face to face. And yeah, I mean, my, my sense is that now that we're, we'll be talking in real money, yeah. it'll go faster. That's good. Yeah. And then on State Highway 119, my understanding is Phil has given this group quite a bit of updates uh, or an overview of what's going on. So I'll be real quick on this, but as you may recall, the vision that came out of the uh, uh, PEL or Planning and Environmental Linkages study that we completed, it was uh, essentially signed off by FH, Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration this last fall. The vision plan for that calls for BRT managed lanes, so it would be something similar to US 36, where buses, carpools, and toll paying cars could use the new inside uh, lane. And then we would also, as part of the BRT, have upgraded stops and stations, park and rides for the bus, and then the plan also includes a bike way uh, to connect the two cities. Um, current funding, and I don't know what was presented. Phil, last time you presented to this group, uh, we 
actually, the, the, the total project cost is approximately, including the Hover Street and a 119 project, is approximately $250 million. The good news is, um, even though we're not anything close to 250, in terms of coming together with financing four projects, we're actually looking pretty good. Um, they will often say money buys money, and in the sense of being able to leverage dollars to get additional grants, whether it's the federal or the state level, the more money you have, the more money you're usually able to get. So right now, uh, most recently, RTD has approximately 30 million uh, available, and CDOT's really come to the table just within the last few months. We knew going into, when we finished the, the planning level, we knew that CDOT had approximately $9 million from Region 4, which is the kind of the northern Colorado uh, subregion of CDOT. But since that time, CDOT has also dedicated uh, from Senate Bill 267, $30 million <coughs> in highway funding, and then an additional $10 million in um, transit funds from the Department of Transit and Rail. And then in addition to that, and you, this number was also probably out before, um, the Denver Regional Council of Governments through the transportation improvement process uh, had granted quite a bit of money to the corridor and along with local government contributions that amount comes to about 14 million. So here again, the project is in no way fully funded, but money begets money. And um, yeah, this is kind of similar to how US 36 happened. It was just cobbling together a few uh, from different funding pots and eventually it all came together. So I'm actually a lot more confident than about this than I was, say, four or five months ago, so. Um, Can it also be done in stages? Yeah, yeah, it, it, oh, yeah. No, I did. <laughs> we, we have started talking to CDOT. It, it, right now, CDOT, through the, what they call HPTE, the High Performance, Thank you. Tolling authority of the or enterprise. enterprise. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Just we'll go with HPTE, which is an arm of CDOT, which manages US 36 and uh, the 470s. They are doing an analysis to determine what kind of tolls in revenue could be uh, could be collected on the corridor and how it would work. Um, but in kind of off uh, more side conversations that we've had with CDOT, they have brought up the idea of, okay, even if we initially aren't able to construct full BRT and uh, toll lanes, would it be, would there still be the possibility to, uh, to establish one of the other alternatives that we looked at in the study, which is, um, Q jumps or bus bypass lanes at the key intersections with the intent that those would eventually be incorporated into a full lane. So short answer, yes. Um, that well, One of the great things about, and I'll put my cell BRT hat on right now. One of the great things about BRT is unlike other projects, you can easily make incremental improvements and that was here again, following the model of what US 36 did, um, even though the new lanes didn't start going in until, I want to say 2014, 2014. We, RTD had started making improvements to the, for the, on the bus side as early as 2008, the big thing being the relocation of the Bloomfield Park and Ride, which if any of you had ever taken the US 36 bus prior to its relocation, know that when you stop there, Depending on the time of the day, the bus could take anywhere from, I don't know. 15 minutes. To a, get to the interchange. A ridiculous, just a, if you were on the bus, it, it was your, you know, Dante's wonderful wings of hell. <laughs> it, it, just, it was horrible. Putting the, establishing the station up on US 36, just psychologically, if nothing else, was a huge benefit. But my point in all that is, we started making investments in the corridor even before the lane construction started, so that 
But one of the kind of downsides to all of that is when we had our kind of ribbon cutting in 2016. Jan 2016. Yeah, January 2016. It was sort of a, well, what has changed because so many things have built up over the 10 years, there wasn't really that, wow, everything changed overnight. So, but, the, but there again, the point being, it's easy as money comes in to start making spot improvements and collectively, cumulatively, um, improve the corridor conditions. So. I have a question. I don't remember where the bus thing is going to be in the middle part and the middle. stop zone would be in the middle or they're on the side? Like the, the, the intent middle. would be in, everything would be in the middle. The yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So the bus isn't doing the thing that has to do with their six or So if, do we have, we don't have any examples local. It, it, Fort Collins would be the closest example of a median stop. So. No, I, I have no good examples that I could point out to a locally, sorry. But, but yes, yeah, it's in the middle. Right. Or would it be like our Kaufman plan, where they are in the middle and then cross? The Kaufman plan is about Dr. Cog, too. Yeah. Okay. Nothing about this Kaufman. Okay. Yeah, and then on the other end of, uh, of the corridor, uh, it includes also improvements on 28th Street and Boulder. Uh, what Boulder refers to as bat lanes, uh, business access and turn lanes. So it allows the only people that can be in that lane is somebody who's making a right turn or a uh, or the bus to also allow for a speed or travel time. Thank you. Thank you. Is that all from RTV this evening before I move on? Thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That was very good. Did any of you want a business card? Sure. Yes. Please. Okay. exciting about some stuff too and he even talked about uh, Vision Zero um, in Oslo, Norway and having one car fatality um, instead of all that we've been having and anyway I, I just thought it was great and, and all the different folks that were showing projects um, within the city and the county it was a really good effort and thank you thank you for your work um, and I just want to piggyback off what Sandy said up to that meeting as well. Um, I really liked Pete's presentation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just kind of speaks to some of the projects we're doing. Mm -hmm. So um, I just want to emphasize my comment from the last meeting. I'm really looking hard at the Coffin Street project and taking parking off of that street. Mm -hmm. I think it would be 
really in line with what our city envisions in the long run. Vehicle access I think it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. I think we should look at it. Just um, I also was thinking about it afterwards and thinking, why don't we have four lanes going down in the middle of our downtown? Can we just have two, one each way? And I don't know. He got it. He's very inspiring. <laughs> it, was, it was a little negative, but also inspiring to say, well, what really could we do? Mm -hmm. um, so that's a nice message. I'd like to get that out to the community um, a little bit more. Um, but that's all I have. So thank you guys for that meeting and inviting us. The whole time was really good. Um, I'm like a bear's tail. Um, okay. <laughs> shaking his head. <laughs> So you heard of all the wonderful things they're doing, and every year Dr. Cog has an award ceremony. So this year they are going to honor our incredible Phil Green. Wow. Congratulations. Congratulations. So on April 22nd, they're going to have the award celebration, and uh, he's going to get uh, a Distinguished Service Award uh, for, um, for almost 20 years. So if anybody wants to go, let me know because the city's probably going to buy a table and the more people there we can mm. do a wave or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> what? April 22nd. What, what time? Is that? That's a Wednesday. Yeah. Oh. What time? Probably 6. It doesn't six always to say. 6 to 9 is usually. That would be PM. Yeah. Go yeah. <laughs> no, down. Oh, no. Before the one day Take one of those peak buses down. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a big deal. Yeah, Dr. Carr does the award everybody, so it's good. All right. Well, good work. She makes me proud. Yeah. You know. yeah. It's cool. So that's it. That's all I got. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, looks like there's. An upcoming meeting in Erie. Um, I think you mentioned this last week. Is there anything to add on that one? Uh, so that's the county landmark project. I was interested in attending March 31st, 4:30 to 6:30. Is that open house time as well? Yes, just like the last one's kind of over. They're just moving it to a different location to kind of cover that whole corridor. Right. Okay. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is that we have a climate emergency. Next April, next month, we'll have our climate task force in here and the night before it goes to council. So. Okay. Will there be some way to run out of that? Or is it just informational? I'm not sure yet. Okay. Depends on what the climate task force comes up with. Is that? Okay. I think what they're going to come up with is recommendations for the major contributors to greenhouse gases. And so each one will have a couple of recommendations they'll want you to peruse. So we'll have that added to you. That Wednesday, I would imagine, with all that information. So, what the business was saying before, that would give you until Monday to read through and just kind of figure out um, how you feel about the different recommendations. And I'm sure Lisa will ask for a, a recommendation for this group uh, to council of what you'd like to see. So, this would be your chance to make comments uh, on those different items for reducing greenhouse gases and the climate emergency piece of this. So. Great. When is the, the county line road meeting on the 31st? What time and where is that? March 31st. Here in Middle School. Oh, it's there. Sorry. Oh, it's right there. Sorry. No, okay. Shh. <laughs> I could probably go to that. Okay. So uh, I think that's all. Everyone said their piece. All right. So I <laughs> said their piece. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I moved it.